Um, all right, welcome. My name is Brian Bouter. I'm a pulp developer, and um, we're, I'm going to present here with Matthias. Matthias, would you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is Matthias Davig. I'm also a pulp developer, and we're going to talk about our current testing strategy and a way we may probably improve it in the future. Um, yes, and uh, because we were preparing so many things, um, we have not run through the talk together, although we did look at the slides together. So Matthias, just kind of um, jump in and help me uh, make sure to share the time. Is that, does that sound OK? OK. Perfect. Um, all right, so uh, we're going to talk about improving Pulp's testing. Um, so here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to go through and iterate through a variety of Pulp's functional test problems. We're going to try to articulate the problem. We're going to talk about a proposed solution. We're going to then look at, for almost each one of them, uh, how PyTest is going to help us solve this problem. Um, originally, this talk was titled, you know, how is PyTest going to help pulp? But we wanted to kind of flip it around and make it a very talk, a talk really focused on pulp's problems first, and then how PyTest is a solution. This is not a technology talk. Um, about PyTest necessarily. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. <clears throat> so our fixtures yeah, are not, yeah. At point, we may note that PyTest is currently not used by, for running pulp tests. So whatever we do, this is at least a small amount of change needed before we can consume any of the good things. <laughs> Yeah, I, absolutely, and I'm glad you said that. We we are definitely going to be proposing that we make some changes, and we don't have to obviously agree on saying you know yes, we want to do that or or a timeline to do that. But there are proposals here, and there is work involved in accomplishing these changes. Um, <clears throat> I think we do use PyTest as our test runner in the CI, but we don't. You, Matthias, you were you were pointing this out to me. What, what, it, what do we do use it somewhere though right now, don't we? Um, at least we don't use it for unit tests. <laughs> okay, we yeah, that's right. There is still documentation how to run the functional tests locally on your box without PyTest. So all of these solutions are all in on PyTest, so there needs to be something changed. Yeah, I agree. Um, cool. So we do use it in our functional test runner in the CI, but as as Matthias points out correctly, that um, there's other places where we don't use it. Also, a lot of our test features, you know, PyTest is a runner, but it's also um, it's the thing that your that your um, tests can inherit from. And right now, most of the pulp unit tests, I think all of them actually, inherit from unit test, which is kind of the official Python three um, uh, test suite. So PyTest is an alternative to that, um, which provides more or less feature parity. But we'll we'll get into that. So we don't use it today, as Matthias points out. Um, so the first problem that I want to point out, we're going to look at like maybe t 10 or 11 problems. Uh, the features are not versioned. So uh, about 45 days ago, we wanted to modify a fixture. And so we made we modified the code on the master branch to match it. And we applied those fixture changes, which gets applied to this fixtures repo. And then we released those after a review to fixturespulpproject.org. Master was happy. And about a day later, David Davis and I realized all the ZStream runners were broken, uh, at which point we had to revert all of our changes. And instead of modifying a fixture just slightly, we had to make a whole new fixture that was almost identical to the other one, except for some small difference. And uh, this is when David Davis and I realized that we can never modify our fixtures because they're not versioned. Because anytime you anytime you mutate one, all the other Z streams break. So PyTest isn't going to help us with this, but the idea here is to keep our fixtures versioned. That would be a good idea. Um, Matthias, anything to add here? Um, feel free to just jump in if you do. Um, so, and also anyone else, if you have a question or a comment, uh, feel free to just unmute and uh, ask it. So our other problem that I think is a problem, at least, is that our fixtures and our tests are stored separately. 
So uh, this creates like a bunch of or several mini problems. Um, but the biggest one is that fits your contribution is separate from test contribution, um, which creates this notion that there's another process, which is a barrier to contribution. Um, I can remember when we were, for instance, developing the alternate content sources work, we needed some functional tests, some fixtures added for functional tests. And we were like, oh, how do we do that? And that's when David Davis said, I'll do it because I know how to do it and I've done it before. So what would be better, oh, I appreciate that. What would be better is if the test author who knows about the fixtures and knows about that work is able to contribute it along with their tests in the same repository. Um, it also slows stuff down because code waits on this review merge cycle of um, the fixtures repo, which is a separate PR. So kind of like doubles the work. Um, it's also a maintenance concern. This fixtures repo is a little dicey in the sense that like who really owns it? Because really every fixture is comprehensible to the plugin that uses it. And we have one repo with all our plugins in it. So, you know, maybe you can understand a few of them, but certainly not all of them. Um, and the one that I'm especially worried about is you can't cherry pick fixture data with the code and the tests. And this um, kind of further uh, further deepens the problem that the fixtures aren't versioned. Um, so if they were stored, if the fixtures were stored in the same repository as the tests, then they would be versioned and they would also be able to be contributed in the same go, which I think would just do good things all around. So this is the first problem where we're going to talk about PyTest's helpful, helpfulness. Um, the problem here is that we have no server side assertions. So we can assert on pulps, and we don't today assert on pulps network behavior. So for example, what this means is that there's a bunch of parts of pulps functionality that we just don't have any tests for because we can't assert on it. For instance, header submission to remote servers. Um, you can configure remotes with headers. Pulp is supposed to send those. We have code that helps configure in, uh, AIO HTTP to make sure that happens. But we can't assert that the headers were actually sent. Um, also, concurrency restriction is the same kind of problem. We have this concurrency restriction feature. It's a really important feature. We don't really have a good way of testing it because we can't assert how many connections were made to the remote from the remote uh, system serving the fixtures. Proxy support, similar problem. Um, we can't, th this one is, I guess, slightly different. It's not exactly server side assertion, but we don't have any proxy tests. And um, recent, like two months ago, I had to do a bunch of work with proxy, pulps proxy support. And that's actually where the idea for this whole talk came from because I was collaborating with the people from AOHTTP and they do have proxy tests. Um, and they use this thing called proxy.py, which is a pure Python proxy. And uh, we um, contributed tests, I contributed tests to AO HTTP that actually use proxy support. So whether we do all these ideas or none of them or anything like that, this one in particular, we could add tests for proxy support. And we know how, because we did it for AO HTTP. So we should do that. Um, but right now, proxy support is totally untested. Um, you know, all versions of it, including proxy authentication, the fact that we use a proxy, go through the proxy um, in the future when AO HTTP fixes their stuff more, um, secure proxy support, et cetera. So we should add proxy support tests. Um, but also authentic authentication credentials. This one's more like the top two bullets. Um, you know, we can figure pulp to send basic auth, but we don't actually assert that pulp does send basic auth. Um, so there's a whole bunch more things like this. Basically, we just don't have server side assertions. So the idea here, um, and this is probably the biggest idea in this proposal here, is to use PyTest fixtures to create an AIO HTTP server at test runtime and have that serve the fixture data. Um, so what I want to do is link to PyTest's fixtures um, and uh, a PyTest fixture for those who haven't used them before, because I hadn't really used them much before, is um, you define the fixture by marking this function as PyTest fixture. It returns the fixture data. Um, and then when you go to use your fixture down here, 
you literally just put their names here and uh, you don't even have to import them. They don't even have to be in the same file. Um, PyTest collects all the fixtures, looks at all their names, and then runs the correct fixtures just prior to running your test and stuff just puts the data in here, like fruit, apple, fruit, banana, this little, this list here. Um, so fixtures are an extremely clean and convenient um, tool that PyTest provides. So what we can do here is we can use this. You should, sorry, you should add that um, this function that defines the fixture is also uh, able to make setup code, then provide the fixture, and then have cleanup code, which will automatically run after the test. Uh, yes. Um, and it's the same way you can, uh, as in this example here, the fruit basket dependent on the fruit fixture. So you can kind of chain fixtures together. Yes, fixtures can um, use other fixtures. Uh, thank you for saying that. And also, there's this other form that uses yields, um, which are extremely helpful. Where, uh, so like in this fixture here, um, the fixture runs, it creates this thing user, it yields it. This is actually the data that gets handed back here for receiving user. It would so it would have that user data would be put here, and then after the test runs it resumes the fixture and anything after the yield is teardown. So it's this extremely clean setup teardown phase. Is this what you're talking about, Matthias? Yes, exactly. Perfect, perfect. Um, so let's look at another example of this. Uh, what we, so we can use PyTest fixtures with that same yield style to create an AIO HTTP server. And this is exactly how all the testing works basically inside of um, AIO HTTP and Pulp can do the same thing. Um, what happens here is here's an AIO HTTP server. It's a PyTest fixture. It sets up Brian, the server. Can you zoom in, please? Oh yes, oh, perfect. Thank you. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, it sets up the server when you run the. So in your test, you're like, I want an AIO HTTP server. You just have to put this name in your as one of your fixture arguments. That's easy. Very clean. And then it actually instantiates the server. And it yields that server. And the server is running at that point. So by the time you get a hold of the fixture, you have a running server that you can literally make network connections to. You do your stuff. And then this fixture resumes, and you tear down the, uh, tear down the fixture. Um, and so Pulp could do the same thing. Uh, pulp could. Um, Pulp could take the fixture data for that particular plugin, and instead of serving it with a fixtures container, uh, we can have the fixture, you know, PyTest basically serve it directly, um, which would allow us to do server side assertions. Because at this point now, we have programmatic opportunities to make assertions around what AIOHTTP.server has experienced, um, whether headers were submitted or how many connections were made. Um, proxy support's a little bit different, but we should do that too, and that's also fixture-based. Um, or authentication credentials um, being uh, asserted. Um, or even configuring that, that you would need basic auth in order to serve those things. You could configure AIOHTTP server to require that. Um, so uh, this is my proposal, I guess our proposal here. Matthias, anything to add here or any questions or comments? Um, so another problem here is that the tests are difficult to run. Um, build environments can't be connected to the internet. And if we, I think we want to run our tests at build time more and more, like RPM build time. So they can't use features.pullproject.org. Um, and ha also, you know, having to build and run the fixture container, it's extra work. And kudos to everybody who's worked on the fixture container. It's pretty slick. Um, it's served us well so far, but it does take work to continue to keep it going. Um, and it's extra work in the CI, it's extra work in the dev environment. And any third party who wants to go and run the tests, and we haven't 
especially made it run all easy for them, they're definitely going to have to do extra work. So let's just not do extra work and let's just let PyTest handle it. That's my proposal here. And if we switched all the fixture data to be run with AOHTP server fixtures, then PyTest could just handle it. Um, another problem here is that there's just a lot of boilerplate code. So our tests just have a lot of stuff in there that we don't really need. They're not creating value. They're just stuff that we do. So things like um, we import these utils, and then we call the utils like just specifically, and then we call the cleanup of objects, and then we use these self.assert calls. Um, and so here's an example of a test that I wrote just to make sure to um, talk about my own <laughs> my own problems here. Um, here's a Paul Bansible test, and we have to do all this importing up at the top, like. We have to import stuff. In this case, a lot of it's even hidden with this like sync helpers mix in, but still this had to be imported. Um, and then uh, we have to, oh, you want to generate a remote? Well, we have procedural code in the test to do this. And pretty much every test is making the same thing over and over again, um, which we could move into like a utility, but then you have to import the utility and you have to call the utility. Um, and even in the utility, you end up doing cleanup code like this, which would just be cleaner, in my opinion, and easier to read and understand um, if the fixture just automatically handled it um, using that yield style. And then, and then we make these like long. They're not. I mean, they're not bad, but they're just difficult to read. Um, they could be easier. Uh, these self dot assert equal things here. Um, and uh, so that's, that's when I say there's a lot of boilerplate code, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, really, if you look at this test, test sync supports mere option true. Well, this could all be a fixture. This could all be a fixture. Um, these are utility functions. These could probably also to some extent be fixtures so that by the time you're running your real tests, you're, you're just running like a couple of assert calls. Um, that would be pretty great. Um, oh, look, here's the example. Oops. Uh, use PyTest fixtures. Um, test stuff. Give me a pulp file repository, assert pile, pulp file repository, something, something. So really like the test itself becomes a lot more about assertions. Um, and the, the other idea here is just use assert, which I didn't understand this about PyTest because um, assert is something that you're really not supposed to do very often because some Python, Python can be configured with flags to ignore assert statements. And so um, that didn't seem safe for me. But what I didn't understand is that PyTest has this really fancy implementation around the parsing of assert and it actually replaces these asserts with their long form self dot assert equal etc cetera, etc cetera. and so my understanding is even if you run python with assert warnings or assert checking disabled these will still work um because when well, python interpreter gets it it's not actually an assert anymore i believe my uh the pytest will never run with the flag that the asserts are ignored Oh, okay, great. That and I think that well, an assert raises an exception, and maybe Pytest is just very good at interpreting that exception. Yeah, uh, that's but great. The the outcome is you usually get useful um, error messages from this. Yes. Um, care about. Yes, yes, you do. So. Um, you know, if we look back at this Paul Bansible, thank, thank you so much, Matthias. If you look back at this Paul Bansible test, like all these assert equals, like it could just say assert this equals that. That would be just easier, better. Um, also, collect reusable fixtures in Pulp Smash as a PyTest Py test plugin. Pul um, PyTest supports plugins, and if you want fixtures to be available, like in lots and lots of places, you can configure as a PyTest plugin. I made these slides a while ago, and I thought more about this. And actually, I think we should just leave Pulp Smash alone. And that's debatable. 
and I don't even necessarily want to debate it here, but I'm starting to think that actually all the fixtures that pulpproject.org and the fixtures repo and pulp smash just should stay exactly as it is. Because otherwise, as we start to change it, we're going to end up with this Z stream break fix issue. But we can debate that later. So maybe we should make a I test plugin. And that's a great way to deliver fixtures across lots of different runtime environments um, where those fixtures are provided by kind of third party repositories. Uh, we do, so this is a little bit more of kind of like a tour of PyTest's great things that it can do for us. So maybe not big, maybe not really significant problems for Pulp, but um, since this is a talk about testing, um, we have some manual duplication of tests. Um, you know, for example, we don't have tests on concurrency restriction, but if we did, we would want to test probably concurrency of one, two, five, and 10, um, or header submission submit one header, submit two headers, um, and make sure the handling of that is as expected. So a great tool to use is PyTest parameterization, um, which lets you, um, on your test itself, use this decorator, which will um, run the test multiple times with different values. And you can pass in more complex data structures that allow you to also change the types of assertions that you make. So like you'll pass in different data and you'll pass in different um, assertions. So this is an example of that. Can, this is like input expected. Matthias? You can even parameterize it to the point that you say with this parameter set, I want it to fail. Yes. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, so parameterization is a thing. If we were using PyTest, we could do this. Since we're not using it everywhere, we can't. Um, we don't have a lot of assertions about log output, um, which, you know, is that a big deal or not? I don't know. But if we want great testing, we should probably assert on logs, especially when they're important ones. Um, we could do it, but we usually don't because mocking logging takes time and people just don't do it. I don't do it. Maybe you all do it. I don't know. Um, so PyTest makes this really easy with this tool specifically made for logging assertions called CapLog. Um, it's a fixture itself, and it lets you really easily um, get a record of the logs that were emitted as part of that specific test, um, which is really nice. Uh, so one, one way or another, we should Sorry. run. Uh, this catalog only works for functional tests because the logging must be emitted by the test code itself. Uh, yes. That's unit tests. I hope that it's a unit test for our functional test where we run Pulp outside of PyTest. Um, there may be another way of doing this. So you can write a fixture, and I have examples in the Pulp CLI repository, for example. Um, that you capture all the Docker logs from the CI container while you run your test suite, and then you can have a fixture that just cuts the part of the log from that test and outputs it with the failed test. Uh, yes, and I'm glad you're saying that because you're touching on a couple of really important things. Um, it's important that we are able to run the test suite against a machine that's not localhost. And so um, we, all of our tests right now don't allow for that, which is unfortunate. So that's another problem that we need to fix. It's not explicitly called out here, but um, we need to make, for example, those logging assertions happen on that external Docker container, just like you said. Um, and the other thing that is important, so maybe cap order is not a great fit in that sense, um, but the, the big idea. Yeah, it is for it definitely is for unit tests. So that's, um, yeah, good point. Um, and then the other thing you touched on is uh, Matthias and I decided to co-present this because I really wanted to give a talk on improving pulps testing. And he was like, "Hey, the C the pulp CLI already uses PyTest." Um, and so, like, if you go look in the pulp CLI's code in its tests, you'll find a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here. Not not server side features um, and assertions, but 
pretty much everything else. Is that right, Matthias? Well, I think that's correct. Um, so one way or another, we should assert on log output, and that would be good. Um, mocking is hard. Uh, mocking is great. Mocking is hard. So just to call it out, there is this thing called PyTest Monkey Patch, which, especially for unit tests, is a, an, I think it's an easier option than mock. Um, there's a whole section here on how to use it. So. Um, that's an idea. All right, so let's get back to some of these kind of more, I'd say more serious issues. Um, so we have a challenge about grouping our tests. Right now, we organize our tests mostly by location in the file system. And so if you look here at pulp file, you've got like, here are the functional tests, here are the performance tests, here are the upgrade tests. Um, and that's great. but what about when tests belong in multiple categories? So say you have all the functional tests, but you have some set of them that are designed to you know, be smoke tests. They're kind of like an absolutely minimal set of things that you can run very fast that will tell you quickly if there's a big problem or not. Whereas the full functional test suite takes a lot longer to run and will tell you a more complete statement about correctness. Um, so our test organization strategy is not, does not really allow for this. My test does, um, because you can mark tests in a lot of different ways, more than I'm going to go through here, but just conceptually speaking, um, you can mark a test in a certain way. And then when you go to run tests, you can say, just run these tests. And you can see here that it's selected one test and the left three deselected. Um, and we could mark our tests as performance tests and functional tests and smoke tests and upgrade tests. And uh, we could still keep them in folders, but I mean, they have to live in some directory structure, but it would just be better. And if you remember the slide before where we had parameterization, you can even say, Take parameter one, mark it as unit test, uh, mark it as a functional test, but for parameter 1000, mark it as performance. Yes. Um, so uh, our next problem is we don't test for expected failures um, very much. Like we do have some tests where you know, there will be particular unit tests where there's like an assert raises check. Um, but that's not what I'm really talking about in terms of failure. I mean, like when a feature just doesn't work, like we haven't added the feature yet. And so pulp doesn't do that thing. And so when you try to make those calls, it doesn't work. Or maybe there's an aspect to a feature that, you know, there's some, some specific aspect of the feature that's not working. And we know that it's not working. Um, and we want to kind of track that it's not working and eventually assert when it is working that it's working correctly. So this is where this thing called X fail comes in. And I'm just going to refer to uh, refer us to this short little lightning talk, which I've seen get passed around a lot um, by someone who I've never met named Pete Gansel. So this person's pitch is that you should test your failures with PyTests X fail. Um, and unfortunately, I can't make this any bigger, uh, but I can put the link into the meet because um, it's not something. Maybe I can make it bigger. Let's go along the line the test should be read. Oh, no. Can read. Say that one more time, Matthias. Um, a test should be read before it can turn green. Yes, a test should be read before it can turn green. Thank you. That is the general idea here. So in this example, they uh, they make this perfect square function. They're, oh, look, they're using PyTest parameterize to test a whole bunch of perfect squares. Yes, these are, these are perfect squares. These are not perfect squares. 15 tests pass. Oh, there's another test. We didn't test for negative values. So let's add a test. 
Um, we know that negative four is not a perfect square, so let's assert that it's not a perfect square. Oh, wait, this test is failing because the code's not right. So why don't we mark this as an expected failure? Because we know that the code's not right. And uh, this allows the test to fail, but not fail the whole test run because it's an expected failure. And then we'll go fix it. Negative numbers are not squares, given how this is. So like, this is a code change. And now, uh, now it says, when you run it this time, well, when you run it, it'll say one x pass. But you can configure PyTest to be strict about its x pass failures here. And if you're strict about it, you can do this system-wide as well. But if you're strict about it, then if something kind of starts working unexpectedly, then your, your failures actually turn to failures. And this is kind of an, an irony, because the code in this case is working. The thing that's failing is that you haven't uh, updated your test to assert that it's an expected pass. And you can set this globally here. So this person's claim is to document your acceptance criteria by adding a failing test, as which documents the conditions necessary to fix the bug. That's a great idea. Um, start by writing the x fail test, um, because that way, as you're writing your fix, you're testing that your code is read first. Your your test fails first, so it's read, and then when you make the code change, it becomes green. This is what Matthias was talking about with the red green strategy. Um, and if you, it, it'll also handle cases where you accidentally fix bugs. Um, and at that point, you just remove the X fail. And then you, boom, you now have a test for uh, forevermore, asserting that you'll never regress in that way again. Um, this is used in practice by the AIO HTTP project. And before we fixed the secure proxy work, the first thing we did was write X fail tests demonstrating that um, we know that's, that AIO HTTP didn't have secure proxy support and that that was an inspected failure. And we merged that. And then we proceeded fixing it. And those tests pass when it's fixed. So that was a great thing. Um, this stuff on this slide is basically a recap of what we just saw in Pete Gansel's talk. So um, I think X fail is a great thing. We should use it. Um, so here's a summary of the proposals. Um, we should move fixture data to their respective repos. I, I, going back to what I was saying earlier, we should leave them alone, actually. But we should, um, as we make this transition, if we make this transition, we should um, be copying the fixture data there. Uh, we should have AO HTTP server used um, as a fixture to serve the fixtures. And we can add in assertions um, where it's valuable. Eventually, like after all these streams are no longer relevant, we should uh, decommission this repo and uh, this website and also the single con fixture container or the fixture container. Um, we should replace all usages of unit tests with PyTest. Um, we should port all the tests. Yes, I know this is an incredible amount of work to use PyTest features anywhere possible. And maybe we can provide them as uh, common features from Help Smash. I, I've kind of gone back and forth on whether that's a good idea or not. Um, and if we do all this, we will enjoy a much better tested pulp. And that is, uh, that's what I came to share. That's what Matthias and I came to share. Tanya. Yeah, I have a question. Well, that's, uh, I think the majority of it, if not all, sounded great. I think our tests are in such a condition that anything <laughs> is done to them. Right. Them, so. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, my question is like about the pictures. I think we, some people like outside of pop use our fixtures. Um, so 
I mean, it would be nice to have a solution which would allow us to share them in non-Python specific way. Um, and I don't know, maybe for de early development or for like some proof of concepts, it would be, I mean, we still can write like pipe fixture, but I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure if it's an easy enough way to do it. But overall, yeah, thank you for the presentation, Brian and Matthias. It's definitely a bunch of good suggestions. Um, yeah, uh, that, you know, there probably is, um, well, more, more than probably, I think there definitely is a, a value maybe in having the Fitchers website still up to provide some testing. You know, like it's, it's nice to have, for example, small OS tree repos or specially crafted erratum repos. Like that could be valuable. So maybe we should uh, still do that. Uh, I know I make use of some of those. Uh, for my integration tests, I sync your repos to, to validate against instead of creating my own. So I would miss them. Cool. That's great feedback. Um, so then let's not take down that website and let's um, recognize its value is for um, kind of third party testing or hand testing. As we probably need to, like, um, do you basically do you want to generate the content for it from the all the fixtures we have in different places, or leave it like as it is? I kind of think just leave it as is, um, just because. Um, I mean, at least what we have works, and so the you know the marginal cost of keeping it working is pretty small. Um, so really, I think it's just that we'll need to move out the tests. Um, so, but yeah, keeping it as it is, I don't think we, I don't think the idea is going to be to try to like deduplicate what's available at features.pulpproject.org with like what the tests use. Grant? I gotta hit my mic button. Um, so first of all, this has been this has been a great talk. Um, every single problem that you mentioned, Brian, is one that I have hit recently, and have been like, oh, "There's got to be a better way to do this." But I, I need to get this PR merged, so I'll just write the test the way we write tests, and I'll think about this later. Thank both yeah. of you for spending the time thinking about the later, because um, all of it, uh, you know, being able to check things on on the server side, I I broke basic auth twice and didn't catch it because the only way to test it would have been to be on the web server noticing what was coming across the wire. And I didn't have that functionality. Um, also, the the my observation is if you're not if you're not writing um, unit tests all or functional tests, especially all the time, it's real because and a lot of times, you know, you're working on a big thing, it takes a while to to get all of the actual feature code working. And whether you do it before that or after that, you go to write tests and the, your first thought is, I can't remember how to do this, at least me. It takes me a good half a day to a day just to get a, a you know, the basic test up and running and then, oh, right, right, that's, that's how this works. The more we can simplify that and what, we're, what you're showing here looks like it would be, it would lower that barrier a lot. Um, and it would be a lot easier to, to, to get the tests in when you haven't written one in a while. Um, so that I'm, I'm a huge fan and, you know, the, the red green testing I have been doing manually, like I'll, I do it backwards, which is bad, but it's like, here's the feature and the test and the test is green. Okay. Now I'm going to check out master instead of my feature branch, um, and, and commit the test and run it and watch yeah. the, the test now, now fails. Um, so I'm kind of doing it, but I'm doing it by hand and I'm doing it backwards and it's just wrong. And I would much rather have this, have these kind of tools available um, for all the, all the good reasons you said. Um, also, another thing about having um, uh, fixtures.org available 
is we use it in examples in our documentation so that somebody can just can have a doesn't have to sync all of you know rel or fedora or something just to watch it happen so that's just another reason why i think having that is useful separate from the way that we happen to use it in uh in our testing strategy um, yeah that's another great reason um I, i'm totally convinced on that and and these are all yeah. um thank you for saying yeah. you know another important reason for us to keep that yeah um, and for your feedback on the on the um the talk i appreciate that no i'm i'm i would love to i as you say it's going to be a, a certain possibly a large amount of work but this is one of those things where if we can find a way to invest the time it'll pay us back in a quarter is what you know just making up numbers off the top of my head i suspect we'll get this time back really quickly yep i agree um why don't we thank you grant um why don't we hear from jared who has his hand raised next jared so in one of your slides you said one of the problems was um basically grouping tests like you could our current grouping is kind of inadequate because we kind of just group everything in just big buckets whereas like with PyTest, we can use this marking feature to um be more specific on like what type of test we want to run. If you wanted to just have yeah. just a group of like very specific, like this is all you need to test like bare minimum functionality. I was wondering, like, could that feature be used to help solve one of the problems that we got feedback on from uh, our pulp survey this year, where users want a way to test the functionality of their setup, ensure that like everything is working correctly. Um, right now, like all we really can to tell them is like, oh, do pulp status, check that everything's there, and then maybe create a test rep repo and then like look at the workflows to follow along with the basic one. But we already have these tests and they don't get included inside like the builds. Um, if you go look at the pit packages, there is no test code inside of it. So like there's no way for them to automatically run uh, test code that we've already are using. So could the um, PyTest be used in this scenario? So like when someone has a user installation, they could just run and run it either through CLI or just as part of the package to ensure the functionality of their installation. Um, I can definitely see something like that. And um, probably you just mean we have certain tests that get the mark and with that mark you run on the, against your production box. Um, what, yeah. I, what I see as a problem is that almost all of our tests are destructive for your user data. So this must be a very, very high bar of non-destructive tests that you can run. And well, if they are not even allowed to create a repository, it's hard to say help is functional for you. Yeah, um, I agree with that uh, challenge, Matthias. And uh, yeah, Jared, I think that's a that's a great idea. I had not even thought about something like that. Um, and perhaps that's where the smoke tests make a lot of sense. Or perhaps we'll be marking, say, sync tests as um, as a as a section of tests as well. I don't necessarily think that's the best idea, but anyways, um, what you said I think is a great idea. One other mark we can immediately apply is this test uses the fixtures container. And so you can run all the tests that don't need it if you are on a disconnected environment. Mm, good point. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, uh, Jared, if, if you have more to share, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I think I saw Daniel, your hand was raised, but now it's not. Yeah. I was, so first of all, great talk, um, as everyone's mentioned. Um, the only the only thing I'm kind of questioning is, it's great to have the capability to test all these different um, uh, server side, um, things that you can, we can only test from the server side. I just wonder if we're actually going to end up implementing like a dozen different bespoke web server, um, you know, test, test web servers um, to test these things. Um, 
it it seems like kind of an investment, um, which is, I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's good to, to test those things. It's just uh, a higher, it's, it's a lot more investment than a normal test. And I wonder if we'll actually be doing that for many things. Yeah. Um, uh, we need to be thoughtful about our, our investment rate and how we invest in one, um, for sure. So total agreement on that. Um, my hope, I'm actually interested in personally contributing some of this work. I'm, um, I'm mostly trying to clear my good name about uh, my former perspective on tests. No, joking aside, um, I would really like to contribute some of some of the at least the groundwork here. Um, so what I imagine would happen for the groundwork, and we can talk details later, but um, I think that we'll have maybe like a basic fixture that provides like serve me up this data. And that one will get used like super heavily, maybe say like 95% of all tests will use that one fixture. And then what we'll do is we'll make a few derivative fixtures, which rely on that original fixture, only they make additional assertions based on for just those situations where we need to assert on the server side. So um, I don't imagine a whole lot of them, but you know we'll know this better in practice uh, than theory. So I was hoping to kind of POC at some point that and share it for folks to consider. Also, along with that, switching the test runners in all the places to use PyTest, which I didn't say this, but it's nice that PyTest test runner is a drop-in replacement for the current test runner, um, at least for the unit test, the Python unit test test runner. So this is in their transition to PyTest guide. They um, point out that people can switch to using PyTest just as a runner and not change one line of code. Um, so we could make that switch and also make a couple of these server side uh, examples. I think we already use PyTest as a runner in the CI, don't we? We do. And this is part goes back to my confusion originally on how broadly it was used, but then Matthias, so that's accurate. But then Matthias pointed out that our examples don't use it and uh, the unit test runner doesn't use it and maybe one or two other places. But the CI functional tests do use PyTest. Can um, can you use PyTest, the PyTest test runner with the Django unit test runner? Because uh, I, I think the reason the reason the unit test runner is different is because we have to go through Django's. I don't know if it integrates uh, with PyTest. Do you um, know there I, is a PyTest plugin that works around that issue. So you don't use the uh, Django test runner itself because it runs the wrong runner. But you have a plugin for PyTest that sets up the, all the Django stuff for the tests. Yeah, and, and kind of separate from that, and that's great to hear, but separate from that, I don't think we really benefit from the Django test runner. In fact, based on my assessment, when you run the Django test runner, you're actually getting a real database, which is the opposite of what Django test runner is supposed to do for you. And I've never been able to explain why. Um, but we need a real uh, one because we are specific to Postgres and it needs to assert on some things to Postgres. But for unit tests, it shouldn't have to, right? For unit tests, right. it shouldn't have to. Make so my my understanding, at least, is that you do get a real database, but it's a separate database from your your production one. It's like a, a, t a test database that it sets up for you and then tears down at the end. Yeah, and this is, and my testing was just not lining up with that, but perhaps my testing was inaccurate. And, but um, let's, let's continue to look at that and we can keep using the Django test runner if that's producing value for us um, and it will work with my test. Um, cool, so I'm gonna, uh, call the time here and um, thank you all for listening and I want to make sure that we have a break before our next session.